Now, I introduced this in June 22nd, the first time I'd heard about this, because I had always assumed that these Qurans began with Uthman. It wasn't until May of this year that I found out different. I went to this debate, and I introduced it at the debate. The debater, Adnan Rashid, who's considered probably one of the best debaters in Britain today, had no response. He held up a coin. He says, Mr. Smith, if you don't believe in the, the Quran existed in the 7th century, take a look at this coin. There you can see the name of Muhammad written on it. There you can see the Shahada. I said, exactly. Do you know who made that coin? His name is Abdul Malik. You just made my point. He introduces that coin in 691. I've just got done saying that. It is he that introduces Muhammad as a prophet on that coin and also on the Dome of the Rock. It's Abdul Malik who is the one that creates and begins the first Quran. It's Abdul Malik. That one, the one that names who the prophet's going to be. It's Abdul Malik, who is one that introduces the name Muslim. It's Abdul Malik, who introduces the name Islam. It all begins with Abdul Malik. You're going to hear this name more and more. And have you noticed that all the mosques are facing Petra until immediately after Abdul Malik, and then they start to face Mecca? It all begins with Abdul Malik. So who is Abdul Malik? He was the caliph from 685 to 705. He is the one that is known as the great Arab reformer. He takes and creates an identity for Arabs. And what do you do when you try to create an identity for Arabs? Remember, they had already taken over Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, Jerusalem, Cairo, these cities that are all over the Levant. They had now taken over all of North Africa, gone all the way to, to India in the east and Spain in the west. This they did by the end of the seventh century. But all their traditions were dependent on Judeo-Christian prophets. All their traditions come the line of Isaac, and they're not from that line. They needed a prophet who comes from Ishmael. So what do you do? You create a prophet. And you redact it back to the man who started the conquest. And we know that Muhammad is historical. He is the one that begins the conquests. He dies in 632. But if he's a prophet, he has to have a book. So you start amassing and borrowing from many different sources. And look at the Quran. It is full of borrowing. 70% of the Quran we can now trace back to Jewish apocryphal writings and Christian sectarian writings. There's nothing new under the sun. They borrow right, left, and center. But when you start compiling it, there are going to be different Qurans. You can see there were different schools. There was one school in Damascus where a man named Abu Ubay ibn Qab had a manuscript that was different from Basra, where there was another Quran that was written by a man named Ibn Masud. I mean, Ibn Musa, which is different from another Quran that was in Baghdad, named Ibn Masud, which is different from another Quran that was in Medina, written by man Zaid ibn Thabit. You remember those names? These are all in their traditions. I'm referring to their own traditions. Dr. Arthur Jeffries in the 1930s looked at all these traditions, and he just looked at what they said about the Quran. And when he looked at the Quran, he found out that there were 11 different Qurans mentioned in the traditions, and there were 15,000 differences between these 11 Qurans. Ooh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Now, why haven't Muslims told us this? Can you see? It makes my job a lot easier. But can you see what we're doing tonight? Everything I've said tonight is now agreed by Western scholars. Western scholars are now concluding that the earliest Quranic manuscripts begin to appear in the 8th century. Muslim scholars conclude that the earliest Musafs begin in the, er, appear in the 8th century. And now, finally, Islamic awareness. <clears throat> Islamic awareness is probably the biggest Muslim website that deals with manuscript evidence. They've been a pain in our side for the last 30 years. Go up on their website and look at their manuscript section. They are now quoting Dr. Tayyip Altakulic. They have to. They have no other choice. And they are for the first time finally admitting that there is no complete manuscript at all in the 7th century. Isn't this great? Yes. Isn't it great to be living at this time? Yes. Can you see that we have now used the same traditions? Remember, the same thing was said of our Bible back in the 1800s. Wellhausen, there in Tübingen, there in Germany start attacking our Bible, saying that much of the Bible is nothing more than redactions, many, many uh, oral traditions, folk tales, that were put together possibly in the 6th century B.C., redacted to a man named Moses in 1400 B.C., about a man named Abraham in 1900 B.C., but that we can't trust any of it. Remember when that came out, and there was a documentary hypothesis, and then there was the redacted criticism, there was source criticism, there was literary criticism, higher and lower criticism, and by 1905, this had moved down into the seminaries, had come down into the churches, and all across Europe, the churches were decimated. 
destroyed the church by 1905. So that today in Europe, only 5% of people go to church. See what historical criticism has done to our Bible. But we were jacked up. We realized we've got to do our homework. Amen. And that's why we started looking around and finding artifact after artifact. And God bless the British. They went all over the world and they stole everything they could and put it into the British Museum so we could look at it. <laughs> and if you come to London, I will take you to the British Museum and you've got to see all the artifacts in the British Museum from the Assyrian period, the 9th and 8th and 7th century BC, from the Babylonian period, from the 7th and 6th century BC, up into the Persian period that supports 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, 1st and 2nd Samuel. Come and see how it supports the book of Genesis, the book of Jeremiah, the book of Daniel. Oh, it's beautiful. All of it using the same criticisms. The same criticisms that we've asked of Islam. We can now support almost every, in fact, there has not been one piece of evidence that has now been found that controverts one properly understood biblical statement. Amen. That's how good our Bible is. Amen. We have passed the test. And if you want to look at the New Testament, just come and look at what we have now found. We have now found 12 either partial pieces of manuscripts from the second century. We have now found 68 manuscripts from the third century. We have found 46 from the fourth century. You add that up, that's 124 manuscripts that predate the Sinaiticus, the first complete 27 book manuscript there in the British Library. If you look at those 124 partial manuscripts, you can reproduce the, the New Testament many times over. And that's 300 years before the Quran even came into existence. We have a 230 manuscripts that predate the sixth century. That's 100 years before the Quran even came to existence. What did I say came into existence? Oh, excuse me, the 8th century. The first Quran only begins to appear in the 8th century. Ooh, I love my Bible. <laughs> and it makes my job an awful lot easier. See, we're asking the same questions of Islam that we've asked of our own Bible. We've passed that test. The Bible passed every test. Source criticism, redacted criticism, the documentary hypothesis, every one of them have been answered. And that's why I tick my Bible everywhere I go. And I love it when they say it's been corrupted. I just ask two simple words, where and when? Where and when? And then I have the platform to just talk about my Bible for the next hour. And you can do the same. You can do the same. Islamic awareness has now agreed that all the Musafs, all the earliest manuscripts, that includes the Topkapi, that includes the Samarkand, that includes the, yes, the Sana manuscript, that includes the Ma'il manuscript, that also includes the Husseini manuscript, and also the Petropotalus, Paris manuscript. Every one of those earliest six manuscripts are all from the 8th century. None of them from the 7th century. So therefore, if the Western scholars agree, if the Muslim scholars agree, if Islamic awareness agrees, Therefore, I conclude that if the earliest Musafs begin to appear in the 8th century, then Muhammad had nothing to do with the Quran. That's my conclusion. Now, I was there on, in the mid-July, I was there on the ladder, and I looked down into the crowd of Muslims that were below me, and I noticed that one of the Muslims in the crowd was from Islamic Awareness. His name is Mansur Ahmad. He's one of the writers for the Islamic Awareness. He had his camera on me as I was showing these different pictures of these different Musafs, his Musafs. I turned to Mansur, and I said, everything I'm reading comes from your website. And I just read from his website, quote after quote after quote. I said to Mansur, you say that the Quran has never changed. You tell me that the Quran is perfect. You tell me that the Quran is, is complete, and that there has been no manuscript that has been destroyed, that all the manuscripts agree. Yet here, I'm just showing you from your own website that the top copy manuscript has 2,270 difference from the Quran we have today. That the Samarkand that you believe was perfect only goes up to Surah 43, was written by an amateur. You're the ones that are writing this on your website. I said, I therefore challenge you to find one complete manuscript from the time of Uthman. One complete manuscript from the 7th century. He closed up his camera and walked away. <laughs> he had no response. It makes my job an awful lot easier. Now, the historical assessment concerning Islam, that the first Arab inscriptions referencing Muhammad only begin in 691, the first reference to Muslims until 690s, the first Arab reference to Muslims is just prior to 749, the first reference to Islam is not till 691, I've already said this, and the first reference to Mecca, not till 741. Can you see what we're now dealing with? There's an awful lot of work yet to be done. 
We now are going to have to piece all the pictures together. We don't have a complete understanding of what this all says. But what we can now say pretty much categorically is that the Quran does not come from God. It probably began with Abdul Malik. And it certainly does not come from Muhammad. And if we don't know anything about Muhammad until the late 7th century, and we don't even have his biography until the 9th century, then should we trust any of it? Now, I want to be careful. If there are any Muslims in the audience, I'm not here to destroy Muslims. I'm here to destroy your Quran. I have nothing against Muslims. It's this book that bothers me. Because it's this book that does to you what I see going around the world. It's this book that damages women. It's this book that damages men. It's this book that damages my God. It's this book that damages Jesus Christ. That's why I can only confront this book. And it's your prophet that takes this book and supposedly gives it credibility. That's why we're doing what we're doing tonight. And I want to tell Muslims, listen, this book no longer is the word of God, but this book is. Amen. Please don't give up God. Come on home to this God. Please don't give up revelation. Come on home to this revelation. Please don't give up Issa. Come on home to Yeshua, the real Jesus. I love the passion of Muslims. I love the fact that they do love God. And they want to obey God. I just want to bring them home to the real God. I love the fact that they are willing to give their lives for their Quran. They don't need to anymore. Give their life to Jesus Christ. So I ask Muslims in the audience tonight and those who are watching, please, I'm not here to destroy you. I'm here to bring you home. Come on home.